All right, so this afternoon I wanted to talk on the subject of fear. And what does the Bible say about fear? So, just an interesting tidbit though. The Bible says the phrase fear not 63 times. There's almost once for every book. So, certainly God tells us not to fear a lot of times. You read in John, in 1 John 4.18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Isaiah 41.13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And Luke 12.7 says, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So, we see that these three verses, and there's a lot of other verses uh, you could read about for the subject of fear not, and <clears throat> what does the Bible say about fear? But it's a commandment by God, as we talked about earlier, who's the Lord of the universe, has, there's none able to stay his hand. It's a commandment from the Lord to his children. He tells us to fear not. He doesn't suggests that we fear not. He doesn't ask us to fear not. He tells us to fear not. And he says, fear not, I will help thee. You know, fear not, you're of more value than many sparrows. God values us and God, you know, there's no reason for us to fear because he cares for us and watches over us. And um, he says that perfect love casts out fear. We know that certainly Jesus' love for us is perfect. And so, when we, if we're filled with His love and filled with uh, thinking about what He's done for us, if that, that's what He's saying. That casts out all of our fears. Um, so I just want to go through a few types of fear that we have in our lives sometimes. And uh, just kind of touch on those and see what the Bible has to say about those different individual kinds of fears. Um, First, there's a, sometimes we have a fear of failure um, as far as fear of failure in men's eyes or what the world considers to be success or failure. Uh, not being successful like in a job or in a family situation or with friends or status. You know, sometimes we worry about what, is, what does society think, what does everybody else think of me? Am I a failure or have I failed at this point? But God tells us that God never tells us to reach a certain station in society or to achieve things in the eyes of men. He doesn't tell us to focus on getting certain things or doesn't esteem getting, you know, some people are very worried about what they can get for themselves is a pretty selfish version of that or they think they need to make sure their family you know, has the best of everything, and that's what love, you know, to try to show that they love their family, they try to make sure they have, you know, the best car, the best house, the best food, vacations, you know, all that stuff to make sure that they are not failing their family. But God doesn't value those things. God values um, obedience to God, trust and faith in God, because he, you know, as we read earlier, the, the, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world, our, the earth is not our home, we're just passing through, there's that song. Um, so, we just need to not have, just in general, we should never have man's perception or man's values as our values. God gives us the values that he has importance behind, and that he thinks are important, and that's what our values should be based on. Um, and more significant or more uh, perhaps serious kind of fear would be fear for Christians, a fear of failure in God's eyes. You know, I think, you know, we know that God has done so much for us and that we do have such a great cloud of witnesses before us and that we have so many great and precious promises. Sometimes we have a fear of failure that we're not going to live up to what we should or that we won't be able to have the faith that we should or that kind of thing. And certainly pleasing God is the most important thing, should be the most important thing in our life. And so you have a natural tendency to fear failing. 
God. Um, part of that idea is based on the fact that you think you can, you have the strength in yourself to please God. But it's really God gives us the strength. He knows our weaknesses. And so let's just see what the Bible says about pleasing God. We read this earlier, but Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So from that verse we, we see that it's impossible to please God without faith. So to please God we must have faith. Because without that it is impossible. So God doesn't ask us to, you know, God tells us to strive, but you know we're not. We don't need to live in fear of failure. We need to just have faith and trust in God that He will take us and make us who He wants us to be, and not to fear that we ourselves aren't going to get us there, because that's the wrong starting point anyway. Because um, God loves us, even though He knows we are weak. He didn't pick us, you know, to be His children because we were strong or because we were really brave or wealthy or anything like that God chose to love us John 16 27 says for the father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God so it says because you know when we love God when we trust in Christ the father himself loveth you so the father the made the entire universe that made everything we can see every person um, you know, he's the origin, he's the creator. He holds every breath, every you know, car ride we take. He's in control of the traffic around us. You know, every storm, every war. God is in control. And it says, the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. And believe that I came out from God. Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. So God knows that we're weak. And he, you know, he's not counting on us to be, to get ourselves to heaven or get ourselves to be uh, pleasing in his sight. He just tells us to trust him and to obey him. He doesn't tell us to be, you know, that we're going to overcome the world. He says that he has overcome the world. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So, God is rich in mercy because he loves us, and so we don't need to live in fear of him as far as being afraid. We need to fear him as in we need to obey him and reverence him. Remember that He is our, our God and our Savior. It says in the ages to come that He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us. So even though He remembers that we are dust, He is very kind to us and He cares for us. And even though we're weak and we're, we often fail, you know, God doesn't want to intend us to be saved or doesn't intend us who have been saved to serve Him and do good works in his name out of a sense of duty or because we're just trying to do good works. We do good works because of the great love we have for Christ for what he's done for us. So we don't do good works to perpetuate our own righteousness or to be righteous ourselves. We just, the reason behind our service to God should be how much we love him and how thankful we are. You know, that should, that should be what's driving and compelling us. The love that he has for us, the joy of the Lord is our strength and that should be what drives our service, not a fear of failure is not the, the right motive. So another fear that we have, is, that we might have as Christians, is a fear of losing friends or a fear, um, basically in relation to society, but a fear of ridicule, um, to be afraid of how the world will treat us or how the world sees us, how people that uh, we know and care about, how they think about us. You know, if they're not Christians, or even if they are, um, when we worry about what other people think, basically, um, and how they consider, you know, what if we're Christians, does that uh, make us lose favor in somebody's sight? Are we, are we, should we be worried about that, or should we fear that? James four four says, 
Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So again, we read that, but God does not say to worry about being friends with the world. He says, in fact, that if you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. Philippians 3.8 says, Ye doubtless might count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Again, God tells us don't worry about losing anything, even friends, the, you know, everything you can have in this world. He says, oh, I think Paul's talking here, he says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, he's lost everything, and he counts them but dumb. He does not care in the slightest that he's lost all that, that he may win Christ. Luke 6.32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man of variance with his father, and, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall, shall find it. So God is just, he, Jesus is very clear that our job is not to find our life in the world. Our job is not to find... Um, success or anything in the world, our job is to follow Christ. You know, even if even if we lose everything in this world, we're to just give it up to forsake it. Nothing should come before Christ in our eyes, in our heart, in our lives. So, and another fear sometimes that we have, um, of kind of more of like the, I should say the flesh, but a fear of not having enough money, you know, whatever you want to say, money, food, or Essentials to survival, you know, we worry, you know, are we going to starve? Are we going to, you know, if I lose my job because for whatever reason, am I going to be able to provide for myself, for my family? Uh, Psalm 37, 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread? And Luke 12, 7 says, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, fear of more value than many sparrows. So God knows that we have needs, and there's, you know, there's a lot of other verses you can read there, but God knows we have, you know, that we need food, clothing, and shelter, but He's promised that He's always with us, and that all things work to our good. So we don't need to fear that stuff, the fear of the loss of that stuff. That's not, that's not having faith, and God says, without faith it's impossible to please God. And uh, when we're worried that God's not going to take care of us. That's certainly not having faith in God. Um, another fear is obviously is something that everyone has to deal with, but a fear of death, of dying. Um, I'll read the verse here first, but it says in Hebrews chapter 2, sorry, verse 14 down through 18, it says, For, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of, his, of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able all... He is able to succor them that are tempted. So, a couple things there. But one is that, you know, whatever temptation or fear we're going through, you know, Christ was made a man. Christ became a man as God and suffered, was tempted just like we are. And so he, he understands firsthand what we're going through. Whatever situation, he understands. You know, he's not... Uh, like Allah, just a God in the sky who just points and condemns and doesn't 
really care. He's someone, you know, Christ came, he understands exactly what we're going through, first-hand experience. But the reason he came, it says, is that he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. That's, you know, that's part of why he came and he had delivered them who through fear of death were all their subject, all their lifetime subject to bondage. So a fear of death is being subject to bondage. This is what the Bible says. So God has not called us to bondage. God has not called us to be in fear or to live in fear in any way, even of death. And, you know, again, the Bible promises us eternal life when we trust in Christ. So loss of all things, the loss of the world, even the loss of your, your human or your the fleshly, the life, you know, the first death, Everyone's going to have to die, short of the rapture, you know, if you're saved, but there's no reason to fear death if you're trusting in Christ, because Jesus said he came and destroyed the devil, you know, that had power of death, and the fear of death is thus, there's no need to fear death if you're trusting Christ. And one of the other fears, it's related to the last one, but a fear of being a martyr, being tortured or losing things, or especially up to death, you know, being a martyr for the cause of Christ. And this is, you know, there's a fear of death as in just dying, getting old, or, you know, there's cancer and all that, and that's there's certainly a temptation to have fear in that, but there's also what can be more of a temptation to be, to fear um, basically going out in a very painful way or a very frightening way to the flesh, you know, there's a lot of, if you read the New Testament, and you know, you know, if you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's a lot of examples where Christ's servants are martyred, and they, they die, and they die for the cause of Christ, and, they, you know, we have to really consider and think about that. God has not promised, God has not promised us a smooth, easy ride where the world likes us. It says the world hates us, and God tells us that being friends with the world is to be the enemy of God. You know, there's only two sides in this battle, and the world is not on God's side. And if, so if you trust Christ, you are not on the world's side, the world's not on your side. Um, let's read 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So again, you know, we're not called to a carnal warfare where we're going to take over the world for Christianity. We're not called to that. God has called us to a spiritual warfare where we, our duty is to tell people about Jesus Christ, to tell people their need of Christ, and God tells us that through that uh, we're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Ephesians 6.12 says, or actually starting in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So not our might. We're not to be strong in our own might. To be, to be strong in his might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So again, we're not fighting, you know, we're not in a warfare that's physical, even though sometimes it definitely has a uh, physical outcome, you know, and persecution and different things like that, but the warfare that we're in is, in is against the devil, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, 1 Peter 4 verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to, to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be made, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So again, it's just it's a reminder, don't be surprised if we're persecuted. Don't be surprised. You know, we just we don't know what the what the future holds, but our God promises us that we will be we'll suffer tribulation in our lives. And so when, when that happens, we're not to be surprised. But we're supposed to rejoice, you know, if we're suffering for Christ, he said, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You know, in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, it says, um, 
blessed are you and men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for, uh, he says for his name's sake, you know, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. God tells us, you know, if we're being persecuted, even if we're martyred for his name, if we're truly, you know, there's a difference between trying to make people mad and getting killed for that or for trying to stand up for yourself, but if you're telling people about Jesus Christ and they persecute you even unto death for that, God says rejoice be exceeding glad. Um, and then John 6 verse 39 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses, loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So again, we're supposed to remember that losing the, all the things in this life, we shouldn't even worry about it. Because when we, when we trust Christ, and lose, you know, we basically cast off all care and all hope for having fulfillment in this life. That's when he says we will find life. When he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Um, so again, we have nothing to fear in death. If you know, even if up to being a martyr, if we're trusting Christ as our Savior, we have nothing to fear in death. And really, the persecutions that we might go through are actually a blessing to us. You know, and it's not something that we go out and seek persecution or do things to become persecuted for that reason, but if we're telling people about the gospel and that's what happens to us, then God says to rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Um, so those are a lot of examples of what we fear, what we might fear in our lives. Uh, mostly, especially for Christians, but just again, who should we fear? You know, we shouldn't fear men. We shouldn't fear the devil. Um, you know, we should have, we should be wise in what we do. But we have no need to fear when we're trusting Christ and trusting the power of God. And we never should rely on our own strength, but on His strength. But Psalm seven, verse eleven. So who should you fear? Said God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Luke twelve five says, "But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath, after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him." So, so that's talking to you know. Well, it's true for anyone, but um, especially talking to the lost, you know says don't fear someone who can just kill your body just as Christians don't fear that but fear him who hath, after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell so it's again it's a reminder don't worry about this life necessarily it's what's important is where your eternal soul where you are going to consciously spend eternity fear him you know if you don't trust Christ as your savior that is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God um, so if you don't know Jesus as Savior, if you don't know Jesus as the one who personally died to pay for your sins, that you have committed and earned yourself damnation, you know, when we sin against God, that justly deserves to be damned to hell. But when we, if so if we don't know Jesus, then we have no one that's covering us. We have to be saved through Christ. There's no other way. Mark 1.15 says, And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. The only way is through Jesus. So, John 3.16 again, it's just, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, if you don't know Christ, that is the only hope that you have, is to trust in Jesus. And once you do trust Jesus, there is no fear... You know, perfect love casteth out fear. Christ's love is perfect. And we have no need to fear as Christians. Um, and then just a reminder for us as Christians, Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Give every man according as his work shall be. So we need to be about God's business while we're here. The time is short, and God promises to reward us according to our works. You know, and, you know, when we go through trials or persecutions, God promises we'll be greatly blessed in that. So we need to not waste our time while we're here.
that's it.